I would like to first off start out by saying I apologize to both Katie and Chris because I put it wrong in my notes. And so thank you for reading 1 Timothy chapter 1. What I wanted to do was read 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 17 or 13, but that's my fault. It is not Katie's or Chris's fault. So we're going to be looking at that portion as part of our text today, as well as Acts chapter 6. So be just thinking about that in just a moment. Uh, they've often said that um, there are two things that are sure in life. Uh, death and taxes. And so I would like to posit that there's a third thing that is sure in life besides death and taxes, and that is conflict. We can be sure that we will endure conflict in this life. Um, conflict is an unavoidable thing. Anybody who's ever been married or ever had kids or ever been around another person in your life has experienced conflict because it happens. It's a natural part of life because we've, we live in a fallen, sinful world. And because of the sinfulness that we uh, exhibit in ourselves and the sinfulness of all the people around us, you can bet that there are going to be conflicts that arise. Uh, the whole book of 1 Corinthians and 2 2 Corinthians, both of those books, are dedicated toward correcting a church that was in all kinds of conflict. And we see that it is natural and it is something that is unavoidable that we will endure conflict of some sort if you've been around any person or been in any church at any point in time. I think it was R.C. Sproul that always used to say that if you ever find the perfect church, don't join it because then it won't be perfect anymore. You can count on the fact that within the body of Christ, within various churches, there's going to be conflicts that arise. It is unavoidable. It will happen. Um, if you look at the scriptures, there are a lot of scriptures that we're given, these commands that we're given to exhibit in the church. Things like love one another, bear with one another, forgive one another. You know, all of these things only are able to be carried out because of conflict. We can't bear with one another unless somebody's difficult to bear with. You see what I'm saying? We don't forgive one another unless we have been offended. So all of those positive commands that we've been given in the scripture, they really are predicated on the fact that you can expect these things to occur. You're not going to find a perfect church. You're not going to find a perfect people. We can always assume that there are going to be conflicts that arise. But what we have in scripture are things like when the conflicts do arise, we find out how we are able to bear with one another in the midst of that conflict. We've, we, we have, uh, uh, we've been told to forgive one another when somebody offends us, to encourage one another, to love one another. That is the same thing as, you know, not every Everybody is lovable all the time in the church. I know I'm not. And so we need to continue to love one another, even when we are unlovable from time to time. And so I bring all that up to, to exclaim this morning that when we get into this particular passage of scripture, we're going to find that our entire passage today from Acts chapter six, verses one through seven comes out of a context where there is conflict that is arising within the church. So this is the first time that we see this um, in the book of Acts. All throughout the book of Acts up to this point in time, the conflict has all been on the outside, hasn't it? It's been uh, that the, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the chief priests, as they're preaching Christ at the temple, they're dragging them in and arresting them. They've even been beaten once after being locked up for the second time for preaching Jesus. There's all this external conflict that's happening. I guess there, you could argue there's some conflict conflict that happened when Ananias and Sapphira were killed, but this is the first conflict from within the church. We see a problem that's arising in the church, and out of this, we have a new establishment, a new office that the Lord has given to us that we see in this. Besides the apostles, we see also these other, this other office being uh, um, created today in this passage of scripture, this office of deacon. So please stand with me this morning as we look at Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. Verse 1. Now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, 
a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their, their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Holy of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of God given to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, penned for us by Luke. Please receive it with the authority that it carries as being the word of God. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing on this time. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that You would give me grace this morning in order to proclaim Your Word faithfully. I pray, Heavenly Father, that You would give us all insight and understanding into Your Scriptures today. Holy Spirit, would You move amongst us this morning, convicting all of us in this room of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, Lord. And I pray, Father, that we would have our eyes open to see you today, that our ears would be open to hear the word proclaimed, that our minds would be open to understand it, and that our hearts would be open to receive it. I pray that you would give me the words to speak this morning, and when you are finished, close my mouth. And I pray, God, that we would all uh, have great understanding and obedience to your scriptures today. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The first deacons are appointed. As we're going to look through this passage of Scripture, I want us to sort of unlearn what we have learned, as Yoda would say, uh, whenever we think about this passage of Scripture. Because probably a lot of us have come from various backgrounds of churches where deacons had various kinds of roles. In a lot of churches, the deacons were more like the elder board than they were um, more of a deacon understanding. Where uh, We're going to see that deacon in this passage of Scripture and also given to us in 1 Timothy chapter 3 has this idea of service or a service oriented ministry. The word deacon is actually just a transliteration of the Greek word diakonos, which means servant. Okay. Now, in this particular passage, there's a diakonos of the tables we're going to see. So that often becomes synonymous with diakonos being the idea of table waiter, but it has to do specifically with the word service. This idea of it's a service position within the church. It is not necessarily uh, the same uh, overseen understanding that it is given to us in the scriptures, though there is some oversight that we're going to see given to the deacons in this particular case. But there is a distinction that's being made in the scriptures between those who are dedicated as elders to the preaching and the teaching of the word of God and those who are dedicated to deacons which are meant to be people who are serving the church. But what I want us to see this morning is this all arose because of a great conflict that was happening within the church, the Jerusalem church. This is still one big church in Jerusalem. We're still finding ourselves in Jerusalem. And even though up to this point in time, it says that everybody was at the same heart, the same mind, going the same direction. They were unified in everything that they were doing. A conflict conflict arose even in the midst of all of that. Why? Because people, that's why, <laughs> because people and because people like you and me, we like to get our own ways or we feel like we're having, we're being accosted or, or something is an offense to us. And so we have a problem with this person or something else. A lot of the time we have two really good natured people, two believers, two people who really have the best intention in mind. And then but they say something that somebody heard that, you know, the wrong way or something along those lines. And suddenly we have two parties at enmity with one another. And that's just how it works. 
because conflict happens because we don't hear things the way we should. We don't say things the way we should. We have a selfish ambition or we, we are thinking highly of ourselves or fi you know, fill in the blank. But conflict will arise. And so here's the conflict that we see happening in this church at this time. It says in verse 1, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. There's a lot of stuff packed in this one verse, so I'm going to try to unpack it for us here if I can. Firstly, we have this I, the, the, the picture of the disciples are increasing in number. So the church is continuing. The gospel is continuing to be proclaimed. If you think about it, what started with approximately 120 people in an upper room is now a church of multiple thousands of people. Multiple thousands of people. That, folks, is what we call an administrative nightmare. <laughs> that is a lot of people to deal with in a very short period of time with very few overseers to manage all of it. In fact, we still just have 12 apostles up to this point in time, you see? And so those are the main overseers. Those are like the elders of this super duper duper mega church of multiple thousands of people. And now you could understand that there might be some ministerial oversights that come from having all of these people and not enough leaders to, to, to assist with all of the things that are going on within the church. And so you see that God allowed this administrative nightmare, so to speak, though it was, you know, it's like, it's like why we find ourselves like a couple weeks ago when we had like 97 people in this room and we're like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? We rejoice that 97 people show up, but it's also difficult. You know, it's, it's a problem, but it's, it's a good, it's a fantastic problem to have but it's still a problem that needs to be solved. And so that's what we see here. That what a wonderful testimony to the fact that multiple thousands and thousands and thousands of people are coming to faith in Christ. Wow, that's awesome. But with multiple thousands and thousands and thousands of people coming to faith in Christ, we see problems arise. Because people fall through the cracks or people don't have somebody helping or administrating things. And now what we see happened here is we see some neglect that's happening or at least an accusation of neglect that's happening between two groups of people. And that arose because of all the things that have come up and all the increasing that God has brought to his church. And so we see this increasing number. This word increasing is awesome. It means like to multiply or like a, a swarm. It's just like this overwhelming uh, multitude of people. And so in this case, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. There are so many interesting things going on right here. Firstly, this word complaint that's being used in this passage is the exact same word that's used in the Septuagint to describe the murmuring and the complaining of the Israelites against Moses in the wilderness. Okay? What an amazing parallel that we see between the Old Testament and the New Testament, how the types and the shadows of the Old Testament continue to point to things in the New Testament. Because the other thing that we're going to see in a few minutes here is what uh, um, uh, Dalton wrote, read about this morning from Exodus chapter 16. We see a lot of parallels there, but we'll get to that in a second. But we see that amongst God's people who are his people. They're definitely his. They've been rescued by God, just like those Israelites in the Old Testament were his people rescued by God. Some complaints arise because people are people. And because you and I have our complaints about things too, don't we? We, we feel affronted or feel like I don't get my thing or my way or fill in the blank and we have our complaints too because people are people and the church is filled with people. And so we see a complaint arise and it says that it's the Hellenists. It's a, uh, the Hellenists were um, 
Like, you remember that when Rome came and, and, and established rule and all these things, there was a, a scattering of the Jewish people throughout the Roman Empire called the Diaspora. And so in the Diaspora, we have Jews now, not just in that Palestinian area, but we have Jews up in uh, um, Asia Minor or even up in Greece or something like that, because we're going to find later on in this book, the same book, Paul is going to go to all of these places. He's going to go to Lystra and Iconium. He's going to go to Thessalonica and Corinth and all these places. And it says his pattern was to go to the synagogue until they kick him out of the synagogue and then go to the, the Gentile people. So there's Jews all over the place. And they're Greek speakers. They're Jewish. They're, they're national in the sense of, by ethnicity, Jewish. But they're all scattered throughout the area. So they don't speak Aramaic like they do in Palestine. They're Greek speakers. So what would happen, though, is that a lot of people who went in the diaspora to these areas, they would come back to Jerusalem when they were close to death. <laughs> and so, because they wanted to die in Jerusalem, so to speak, or in Palestine. Well, what happens when you come back and you come to Palestine and you die, you leave behind a widow who's in need. And so it, um, Jerusalem in this area had a high number of these Hellenistic widows because they would be left in Jerusalem with nothing, you know, no one to take care of them or anything like that. And so, so we see these Hellenistic widows being helped in this daily administration of ministry. And then we see these Hebrews. The Hebrews are the Aramaic speaking ones, the ones who have been there, whose families are there and all of these things. But in both of these cases, we see that these are destitute women who have lost their husbands and so therefore lost sort of their means of provision. They've lost this, um, this uh, uh, ability to be able to be cared for because their husbands have now died. Um, this is one of the reasons to have kids, by the way, just so you know. That honoring your father and mother is one of those things that needs to happen for all of your life. And so if wives, if you have a husband that dies, that your kids can rise up and provide for you or take care of you. And that's what should be happening. Um, and that's one of the greatest things, one of the greatest reasons why we have children is not only to create more people, more disciples for the kingdom of God, but also so that our children may rise up and care for us in our old age. And how sad is it to have a, a, a you know, where you have no means for that, you know, um, in your late life, you have nobody to take care of you, nobody to provide for you. Well, in this case, and there's a lot of these women who are in this situation. They have no one to take care of them. They have no one to provide for them. The church is ministering to them and they're, and they're helping take care of them. According to James he says that pure and undefiled religion, according to James 1, is that we visit widows and orphans, that we take care of them. God says throughout the Old Testament and the New, he has a great heart for the widow, the orphan, the sojourner, the foreigner. All of these things, God says, take care of these people because they have no means of taking care of themselves, you see. God is a father to the fatherless, and he loves widows and orphans. And so he's called his people to do that. And that's why we need to think of that in our own ministry, how we ought to also be ministering to widows, to orphans. I think, I'm thankful that even in this very room, we have a couple of orphans who were taken by a family and brought over here and have become a part of the family and are now being taken care of. Praise God for that. What a wonderful testimony that is. Because all of us in this room... We're once illegitimate orphans outside of Christ. And those of us who are now followers of Christ have been adopted into his family. We, have be, we who were once not a people have become a people. We have been brought into his household with God as our heavenly father who were once illegitimate children but have been adopted by, by God through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so that we ought to carry out that same testimony in the way that we love and minister to people as well. So there's a complaint that arises because the, the, the Hellenistic widows feel like they're being neglected in this daily distribution of needs, okay? Money, food, who knows what it was particularly, but it was probably something along those lines. And so they feel neglected, and so now a conflict is happening. This is unfair. All these Hebrew people are being taken care of. We're not being taken care of. Is it because we don't speak 
Aramaic? Is it because we're some outsiders to you? And you can see how quickly a little spark erupts into a great conflict within the church. And so in order to handle this conflict, in order to handle these things that are happening here, um, it says in verse 2, And so the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Okay? So this idea, uh, the full number of the disciples, I think it's interesting how, how it's bring them all in. They bring the congregation into this. And so this is why we at this church are not an elder ruled church, but we're an elder led church in the sense that we as the elders oversee the ministry of the word and the teaching, and the preaching and the prayers, and we oversee your souls and things like that. But when we need to make big decisions, we're going to bring you in on that. We're not your overlords here. You see what I'm saying? And that's what we see the apostles doing here. They bring the congregation in and say, hey, we've got an idea because we we can't do this. And notice also when it says that it's not right that we should give up the preaching of the word of God to serve tables. It's not that they were saying that serving tables was beneath them because that's not what the scripture is saying. Those who serve the tables and those who do the preaching are on the same footing before God in the sense of we're all serving God with the way he's gifted us and called us to serve him. What they are saying is this. We have a calling on our life. We have been commanded by Jesus Christ himself for the proclamation of the word of God and for prayers, the ministry of the word. We've not been called to do this other job. You see what I'm saying? If we had been called to do this other job, we'd be doing this other job. They're not saying that they're above that service. What they're saying is that would be disobedient to their calling that Jesus Christ placed upon them in order to do that service. Just the same way, for somebody who has not been called to stand in a place of proclaiming the word of God, for somebody to stand in that place who has not been called there, instead would do that, that would that be them being disobedient to doing that, because that's not what God called them to do, you see. There's no big eyes, there's no little, no little use in the kingdom of God. It's not more awesome to preach than it is to run the camera. Both have to happen. And some people he's called to clean the church and run the camera and, and set up the chairs and the tables. And some people he's called to preach. Some people he's called to visit and do all of these other things. He's called us all in the body of Christ to fulfill the purpose for which we've been called. So don't look at this and think that the apostles are sitting here thinking that they're too haughty, that they're too elevated, that they're too high and mighty to stoop down to, to waiting tables. What he's saying is it's just not appropriate because it's not how we've been called. And so they come to that. And so let me just say, from the purpose of what we're talking about here, Bill and I have been particularly called to minister to you all through the proclamation of the word of God and the ministry of the word and through prayers. We do other things in the sense of caring for the congregation and things, but we also have people, as we're going to see here, who it's their, per, it's their, their particular calling and responsibility in this church to visit and to care and to do the things in this church differently than us, even though we've, we've done that. In most churches... Um, the pastor's kind of this hireling. It's, we hired you pastor, so if anybody, you know, ever has any need, it's your job to go take care of that. But that's not what the scripture says, okay? That there have been roles given. And, and, and so many pastors are such poor preachers <laughs> because they've spent all their week trying to do the things that were meant for the deacons to do that now they have nothing to say on Sunday morning because they haven't been in the Word, why? Because they've, been, they've gone out in distraction to go do all these other things when what they've been called to do is to proclaim the word of God. Something's got to suffer. And as we talked about on Tuesday this past week, if somebody is one of those really dynamic people who are really able to go out and shepherd the flock of God and minister to the people on an individual level, and they're really, really great at preaching on Sunday morning as well, a lot of the times, those are the guys where their family is suffering then. Because something's got to give. No one person has been called to do everything. 
No one person. And if, if somebody feels like they have to be all things to all people, somebody's going to slip through the cracks. Somebody's going to suffer. There's only 24 hours in a day. There's only seven days a week. And whatever you say yes to, you have to say no to somebody else. So it's not any of us in here who have been called to do all the things. That's why God gives eyes and feet and ears and hands and mouths and all of these things to the body of Christ that all together, if we're operating as a healthy body, all of those things are met. But nobody in here is a superstar. Nobody in here has been called to do all the things. And so that's what the apostles are saying here. This is not our job to do this. We've been called to this task, not a higher task than you, but a different one, because this is how we've been called. Okay, now those who proclaim the word of God will receive a harsher judgment. I'm going to receive a harsher accountability before the Lord. So I better make sure what I preach to you and speak to you is the truth, because that's what James says. Let, let, let not many of you become teachers. Okay, so be careful about that. So in that sense, there's a higher calling in the sense of, boy, you better watch it. Because you have a higher calling in that sense. Not that you're any higher than somebody else. You understand what I'm saying? Am I coming through clearly there? Okay, very good. Number three, verse three. Therefore, brothers, so now, okay, we, the, the problem was identified, the problem is addressed. Now it's, how do we solve this? Okay, how do we solve this? Verse three, therefore, brothers, okay, he's saying to the brethren, the saints, the people out there, the congregation, the apostles are saying to those in the congregation at this point in time, pick out from among you seven men of good repute full of the spirit and of wisdom whom we will appoint to this duty verse 4 but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word okay i love this this reminds me so much of that exodus chapter 16 passage Moses is doing all the work. He's overseeing all the judgments and all the people. And he's just sitting on the seat of judgment all day, all night, hearing all the complaints and all the judgments from everybody, delivering to them to the word of God. And Jethro, Jethro, I love that name, uh, Ruel, Jethro, his father-in-law, says to him, you're taking too much on yourself. You can't do it all, Moses. So appoint people, tens, you know, hundreds, thousands, and let them be overseers. And from that came what we know in the scriptures to be like the Sanhedrin, right? Those are the, the elders, the overseers of the nation of Israel. Those are the ones who oversaw some of the lesser um, judgments. But think of the qualifications that were given to them. Those who are full of the Holy Spirit. Those who fear God, who won't take a bribe. And look at how those sort of parallel what we see here. What do they say? Pick brothers from among you, seven men. Wow, seven to kind of go with the 70. Kind of an interesting parallel. Of good repute, okay? That means that, hold on, I have a note here. I, I don't like to use notes too much, but these are, these are, these are really good. Um, the word good repute means to have a good testimony or a good witness. It's actually the same word that's used for the word martyr. It's the same Greek word that's used there. Those who are bearing testimony. So in other words, they better be saved and they better be able to bear the testimony of being saved. Okay. So these people who are serving have been called to be men of good repute, full of the Spirit. It's clearly identified that the Holy Spirit is active in their lives. They demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, the, the fruit of regeneration. Okay. And that they have been given wisdom. Okay, wisdom. That means discernment. That means not just knowing the things of the scripture, but being able to discern amongst the people. Why? Because they're going to have to be problem solvers here. They're going to have to show godly wisdom. The whole point, the whole reason why these deacons are actually even being appointed is because of the conflict that's there. So they better be people who are problem solvers. They better be people who are, who are, are, uh, um, able to view the situation, disarm if necessary, and solve, resolve the situation. You need wisdom for that. You need to know how to take the scriptures and apply the wisdom of the scriptures in order to do that. Notice also that it's seven men, okay? Seven men who were called out in order to do these things. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, they 
exclaimed their responsibility. But what's interesting here that I want us to see is that word ministry right there. That's the word diakonos. Okay? There's a diakonos, those who serve at tables, so to speak. And the apostles are saying, we serve through prayer and the ministry of the word. You see? But everybody's serving. We're all serving. We're just serving in different ways, different capacities. I want to also mention that when we look at scriptures like 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we look at the role or like the um, qualifications for elders, qualifications for deacons, and verses 1 through 13 there, um, those are people who are already displaying those things that are being called out. Does that make sense? That means that those qualifications aren't just for elders and for deacons. We're all supposed to be acting like that. It's just that you don't grab somebody who's not acting like that to fill that role. You see what I'm saying? So don't glaze over. Don't sit there and think, oh, that's not for me because I'm not ever going to be an elder. I'm not ever going to be a deacon. No. We've all been called to be wise. We've all been called to be full of the Spirit. We've all been called to bear witness. And according to the qualifications that's given, we've all been called to do things like be hospitable, not be addicted to wine, not to, to, to be a one-woman man, right? To, we've all been called to do that. It's just that you better make sure that whom you select are the ones who actually are displaying that. But that's not just for your elders to be like that. That's for all of us to be like that. It's just that you can't be an elder unless you are that. Does that make sense? So those who keep their household in uh, subjection, you know, those who have a handle on their household, those who are able to, who are, who are not given to sexual immorality, who aren't drunkards, things like that, who are able to be hospitable, who are self-controlled and temperate and all of these things. Well, that sounds a lot like what we're all supposed to do because it doesn't mean, well, I'm not an elder. That means I can go run around on my wife. No. <laughs> Duh. Okay. Duh. Of course not. It's just that if you're a person who's been known to run around on your wife, you're never going to be an elder, you see. That's the point. That's the point that he's making, okay? Is that, is that we have all, and I want us to know that, that though you can't be an elder or a deacon unless you do show these, demonstrate these, these are what we've all been called to do, okay? Um, so, verse 5. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, Timon <laughs> and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. I'm probably butchering some of those names, so forgive me for that. And they set them before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. This is very close to how we would and how we have it in the bylaws of this very church and how we would bring about uh, deacons and elders and things is that, is that we may suggest somebody to the congregation that we think is a person who might fulfill this role, but it would be the, the church in participation with the elders in selecting that role. Does that make sense to say, yes, we're all together on this. We're all coming together to do this. And I think that's interesting that we see this here. The, in this particular case, it was the congregation that brought the people to the apostles Apostles under the commandment of the apostles, by the way, because that was a command earlier when they said, bring people to us who exhibit these things. And so they're like, they all identified, oh, here are the people that are doing this. They brought them before the apostles. But then the elders, OK, the overseers had the word to say, yes, we agree with you. And we're all together on this, you see. So you see a lot of authority of the apostles being demonstrated here in the final selection, the final laying on of hands, which means they also had the authority to say, no, not that one, <laughs> because we don't see in their life the things that exhibit what we see here. So it, and they need to measure up and they need to, 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 uh, to pass the tests of the elders, so to speak, or the apostles. And it says in verse 5, I want us to see a couple of the people here. Luke is going to focus very heavily now in, these next, in the rest of this chapter and in the next two chapters after this. Not on the apostles and the things that they're doing, but on the deacons and what they're doing, which is really interesting because we're going to see that the very first person who died for the faith of Jesus Christ was not one of the apostles. It was a deacon. 
Stephen is the first one mentioned here, and we're going to see him proclaiming greatly next week as we look at him going out with great boldness, proclaiming the gospel to the people. So this is a real man of God. This is a person who's really exhibiting these things, who is bearing testimony, and who is fulfilling even to the point of the full understanding of this word, martyr. He's bearing witness here. So we see Stephen moving greatly and doing amazing things as a deacon in the church. Then we see uh, Philip, the very next chapter after the stoning of Stephen. Philip is going to the Ethiopian eunuch, and he's like here in one place, and he's here in the next place. <laughs> kind of this wild thing that happens, and Philip is this other guy. He's not a pastor. He's not a preacher. He's not an elder. He's just a deacon. And I say just a deacon in the sense of, we always think that it's like the job of, of like the elders or the pastors. You go out there and you do the preaching. You do the, no, 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 no. Once again, yes, we proclaim the word of God and we have the ministry of the word. But we've all been called to do that stuff. We've all been called to go proclaim. We've all been called to stand for the faith of Jesus Christ and even die if necessary. It's not just for the superheroes of the faith, so to speak. It's for everybody. It's for everybody. It was a deacon who died first for the sake of Christ, not an apostle, not a pastor. So it tells us all that we've been called to this high calling. Um, the only other one that's even remotely mentioned anywhere else in sort of church writings is the next guy named uh, Pro Procurus. Procurus. He, um, some, according to church tradition, think that he might have been the what's called an amanuensis. An amanuensis is like a secretary, okay, um, for John. And so that John's gospel, you know, John is articulating the gospel and he's writing it down, which is one of the reasons why this is an aside. But it's good to know in case anybody ever comes at you and say that the, God, the, the, the scriptures aren't right and things like that. If you read first Peter and you read second Peter, they're wildly different in their construction of writing. Well, what probably happened is that Peter in first Peter um, had an amanuensis who wrote it down and they think according to church tradition, he died. <laughs> and so then Peter the fisherman writes Second Peter himself, and it's just terrible Greek. <laughs> it's great. I love how God uses the personalities and the skills of people in order to do what he's going to do. And it's just awesome. Um, so that's neither here nor there, but I just love stuff like that. Uh, same with Mark. Boy, Mark is a Hebrew speaker who tried to write in Greek, and so that's why it says immediately and in 157,000 times. Immediately this happened. Immediately this happened. It's because he's a Hebrew guy trying to write Greek, and it's just really awesome. But look what happens. After they bring these people in, in verse 7, we see a continuing statement that we saw earlier, don't we? And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. So now, now the gospel is going everywhere. Now those same priests who are so antagonistic, we see some of them now coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Why? Why? Because the body was broken for a minute. They brought about a resolution by bringing in new people to oversee this administration of things that were the normal administration of the church, not just the ministry of the word and the ministry of, 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 um, of prayer. And so they were able to then resolve the problem. The church got back on the right track and now it's doing the thing it's been called to do. Okay? Okay. Deacons are invaluable. The servants of the church. The, the, Bill and I don't set up the chairs every week. Well, except Bill does sometimes. On <laughs> Tuesdays and stuff, he's got more time to do it. But we've got people who come in here. These church, you know, these chairs don't set themselves up. The, the lights don't turn themselves on. You know, the, the communion bread that's made back there doesn't make itself. You see what I'm saying? This church doesn't get cleaned by itself. Uh, uh, the, the music that's put together doesn't get put together by itself. It all happens because men and women um, are joining in on the service of things. And we have deacons who are acting as sort of uh, in these roles, these oversight roles of the things that, that are going on in the administration of the church. We have two deacons that oversee the finances. Bill and I have no visibility into who gives what. Okay, 
Because we don't want to be swayed by that as the elders of the church. But we have all of these that are taken care of, all these administrative tasks that are ta being taken care of by godly men who are overseeing these things. Overseeing these things. Just overseeing things a little different than, than what the elders do and how they serve in that way. We've all been called to serve. We've all been called to minister. So be doing the things that you would aspire. You know, they say uh, dress for the job you want, right? So, so if, if you had any aspiration to, to ele be elevated to a particular role, well, then you got to have the trappings that the scriptures say you should have. Dress for the job you want. Because it's not something um, that, that you sort of rise to. It's something that you already are. And then you're used in order to do that. Um, fantastic passage. Don't be surprised whenever we have difficulties in the church. Don't be surprised when things like this come up. We're going to step on each other's toes. We're going to make each other upset. We're going to say things that uh, may be taken wrongly or badly or offensively against other people. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Um, and, and as we read during our time of confession, I love that particular time of confession prayer where it talks about you know, how quickly we, we want mercy and grace shown to us and how quickly we bring judgment upon others and condemnation, um, how, how we are so offended because we think too highly of ourselves and we think too low of others. Boy, oh boy, we are all sinners in here, folks. And we are all people who have been saved by the grace of Jesus Christ and that grace alone, if you are his. Um, there are no big eyes and no little use in the kingdom of God. Um, we all have our blind spots. We all have the ways in which we have offended. We all have ways in which we've been offended. That's why we have things like Matthew 18, right? To go to the person who's offended you. That's why we have things in the scriptures like love one another, forgive one another, bear with one another, because we have to. We have to. That's how the church is supposed to be. Jesus himself said that the way that they will all know that you are my disciples and that you have love for one another. You know, not the Jesus is my homeboy t-shirt. It's because of the love that you have for one another and the devotion that we have to the scripture. So, so let's be a body um, that, that is quick to forgive, quick to love, quick to bear long with one another, quick to show patience, um, uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility value others above yourself. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay? Conflicts are going to come. Bear long. Love one another. And sometimes, in cases, people need to be brought in to help resolve the situation and the difficulty. So, so be obedient to those things and think about those things. Um, and don't be surprised uh, when conflict comes. And be quick to repent if you're the one through which it comes. <laughs> you see? Because I, I've been that. I have foot and mouth disease. Okay? I am really bad about saying the wrong thing in the wrong way at the wrong time and putting my foot in my mouth a lot. I know that. So please forgive me and allow me some grace to also come to my senses and be like, yeah, boy, that was wrong. That was bad. And I'll try to do the same for you. And we'll try to do the same for one another um, as we think about this in the church. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we praise you, O Lord, and thank you, God. Um, there is no one in this room who has been more offended than we have offended you. And so, God, if you in your mercy and your grace and your patience have shown such forgiveness to us who have rebelled with sh shaking fist at you, God, with such cosmic treason that we have made against you. If you, through Christ Jesus, can forgive us of our sins, we also ought to forgive one another for the offenses that we have created. Father, I pray 
that our church would be united in Christ Jesus, our Lord, that we would be united in the scriptures and united in fellowship and love for one another, Lord. And as even at this time, there was a conflict that arose in the church and the first deacons were appointed in order to uh, help resolve that conflict. Lord, help us in this church to resolve the conflict when it arises, because it is going to arise. We already have had conflicts in this church. Help us, Lord, to uh, follow Ephesians 4, that we ought not let the sun go down on our wrath that we ought not to let bitterness and anger and clamor rise up in us. Help us to forgive. Help us to not hold on to offenses with bitterness and unforgiveness, Lord. Forgive us for the times that we have done that, Lord. And Father, I hope and pray that as this hasn't been a tremendously evangelistic sermon, yet, Lord, in the understanding of how we've been called to address one another, we realize that there's no possible way that we can do this outside of the Holy Spirit regenerating us. And so, Lord, I pray if there's someone in here that has not yet trusted in Christ, who still has their offenses against you uncovered and unforgiven, may they repent, Lord. And may they trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and obtain the forgiveness that is given to them in Jesus Christ, Lord. May they be rescued from their sin today. And I do pray, if anyone in this room is harboring any sort of ill will or conflict with anyone else in this room, that, Lord, you would give us all grace to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, to follow after you, and to seek to make reconciliation there, Lord. We want to emulate Christ. And as you said in your prayer, forgive us our trespasses, even as we forgive one another's trespasses, Lord. I pray that we would truly put that into practice. So now, Lord, be with us as we are about to fellowship with you at your table before we fellowship with one another at the tables we'll have out today, Lord. Bless this time, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.